I think you have no excuse but to employ wherever you are, whether you're in a clinic the size of this platform or if you're in a great performance facility like this, and really regardless of any equipment that you have. And it's all based around something that I'm very fond of, and that's speed. Uh, I have been blessed to be around some of the fastest humans ever to walk the planet. Um, we've had several of them tested, and we've trained several of them. Uh, and and I, it, it's kind of changed my mindset about speed, and it's, it's allowed me to kind of think a little freer about things uh, that, that maybe I at once thought were rules that, that you have to do. And it's because I'm, I'm watching these freaks do what they do and see how they do what they do that I bring you some of these tools today, okay? Before we get started on all this basic, this, this high-level stuff or this acceleration stuff, know this. Get them stronger, Right? Get them stronger. Let's, let's hard stop there. If you're not doing the basic stuff, some of the advanced stuff's really not going to matter. So I say that's my disclaimer. Do the big things. Move the big rocks first. But I promise you, some of the rocks that I'm going to show you here are going to help modulate and bring some focus into specifics of one part of speed that I'm very enamored with because it's very changeable, and that is acceleration. And acceleration is a very different biomotor task than just speed. Okay, so we're going to go through some of those biomotor things about acceleration, some of the things that you can do in the weight room to tweak up a little bit on the acceleration side of your speed. We're going to take that into plyometrics and show you some tweaks on some plyos to make it a little more plyometric targeted. And then we're going to go out and I'm going to show you the speed decrement theory. And it's something somewhat new, somewhat new. The scientists had to show me this. Some of you may have already figured this stuff out, but we're going to change the way we think about how much weight and resistance we use on sleds specific to acceleration and specific to the individual. We're going to individualize resistance on the sled and go beyond just a percentage of a guy or girl's body weight. So hopefully those, those are three kind of big key chunks that we're going to move into. Uh, guys at home, sorry you couldn't be here. We're going to try to move around pretty fast. Uh, if you guys want, and instead of doing a PowerPoint and throwing it up on the screen, I know all of you own one of these. I'm going to let you pull this out. Okay, go ahead and pull your phone out. All the notes for what I'm going to do are on my Twitter account. So you're all going to be new followers of mine. How about that? You want my notes? Uh-uh, no emails. You get on Twitter, okay? My Twitter handle is on the board right back there. You guys want to part the Red Sea there? My Twitter handle is at MJPLanceW. All my notes are on that. And what, if some of you guys that have been following me already have found out, we're going to be talking about three hacks to acceleration. And the first hack, the first hack is going to talk about force and about how much force. We know that fast people are able to develop a lot of force. However, the fastest people in the world are not necessarily the strongest. Oh gosh, don't strength coaches, don't get all pissed off at me, okay? It's okay. It's okay. They're not the strongest. Usain Bolt cannot deadlift 900 pounds, despite what you read on the internet, okay? No. There is a certain amount of force, though, that they tend to all gravitate towards, and it's a percentage. It ends up being a percentage of their body weight, and it becomes a relative number, okay? And so that's the number we begin to hang our hat on. So the first hack of acceleration that I want you to look at, and it's up on the board if you're looking, but everybody find my, my Twitter handle? Everybody find me? Follow me? You can pull up my Twitter feed and you can see this first series of infographics. As you scroll through there, you'll find all this stuff. The first one is the three hacks of acceleration. First one is around getting strong enough. And I put the word enough in quotations, okay? It's always great to get stronger. But when it comes to acceleration, we've started to kind of figure out that maybe strong enough should be our first order of business. And our first order of magnitude is to increase our relative strength. And one of the, my favorite ways to do that, whether it's the high school kids that I used to train or some of these freaks of nature that come in, is to utilize the hex bar. So how many of you guys know what a hex bar is? You raise your hand, everybody does, right? How many of you have hex bars? Raise your hand. 90% of you probably have those too. Very simple tool to use, uh, but I'm going to show you some basics of how to potentially tweak it a little bit to make it a little more refined for acceleration. I've got my six athletes up here. You guys are going to be my, my focused athletes up here. So Talia and V, you're going to come up here on the, on the platform. I've got you guys over here on this platform. We've got platforms set up with the hex bar. The reason the hex bar is, is, is one of our favorites, 
Um, one is it's a low, it's a low uh, level of input. In other words, we can get somebody involved in hex bar deadlifting pretty rapidly, right? Not a huge, big teaching and learning curve responsible for this. We can get novices moving weight uh, pretty well. It's actually easier to teach than the squat. I don't mind the squat. Squat's fine. My business, though, is I have six weeks with people. They pay me an amount of money to get them better. And if I don't get them better, guess what they do after six weeks? They ask for their money back and they want to go somewhere else. It's not about teamwork. It's not about toughness. It's not about rah-rah. I have to give them a return on investment. And so I'm looking at huge, huge, efficient things to do. It's got to be efficient. If it's not efficient, it doesn't end up in our program. Okay? Because I just don't have the time. I'll see them maybe 12 sessions once their entire lives, and they're going to judge how effective we are based on that. That's the rules that i got to deal with. Okay? I can complain about it, or I can make it happen. Right? And so let's figure this all out as an efficient way of doing things when there's a lot of ways to get people better. And as you guys know, unfortunately in our profession, everybody gets better, don't they? That doesn't make us very special in this room, huh? That's sad, isn't it? It's not like this is, we're a bunch of brain surgeons in here, right? People just get better when you work them. Okay? That means there's a low entry point into our profession right now in terms of knowledge. These are chances, these, these gatherings and this information are chances for you to level up your efficiency because that's what clients are looking for. That's what athletes want. They want it sooner, they want more of it, and they want it in less time. So that's a great differentiator for you guys that are just entering in the field or some of you guys that are 20-plus veterans like me, always looking for something more efficient. The X-bar deadlift is one of those. So let's pull the deadlifts out. Let's pull the X-bars out here, girls. Roll it out. You guys go ahead and roll yours out too. Okay. The first place that we look for on the hex bar is what position are we going to put these athletes in to lift? And everybody has this, this magical technique on the hex bar, right? That it's got to be your shoulders have got to be here and your knees have got to be here. Let's for a minute not think about getting good at the hex bar because I don't give a dang about somebody that's good at the hex bar. You know what I want? Faster people. I'm using this as a tool. So now let's think for a minute. What does it look like if you can envision someone accelerating? They're starting from a base position or they're starting from a glide position or even from a crouch start if they're a track athlete. What do they look like when they're initiating and begin to propel themselves down the track or down the pitch? Well, if you don't have a good imagination, go to your Twitter feed. I've got a cool dart fish analysis and you guys can look on the board right there of somebody that's taking off in an acceleration pattern. So everybody pull your phone out. And look at what it looks like. And it, what it looks like, and I'm going to use Talia here as my, as my demo. You guys can follow along on your phones if you're that kind of learner. Scroll down, you'll see one of the uh, dartfish clips, and it's kind of a black background with a yellow. That's a Safa Powell, by the way. That's his skeleton running in space. So he's one of those freaky guys, right? Freaky, freaky, fast accelerators. And some of the things that we found out when we look at these guys accelerating, and he's coming from a crouch start in that video, but let's just use it from Talia State. One of the things that we notice is that they are pivoted, they are hinged at the hip, right, when they're applying force, and that this thigh is in front of you. So step forward with this thigh for me, just like that. So we know that they're going to be in a pivoted position or hinged position, and they're going to need to apply force through the ground, single leg, on a flexed knee. And if you look at force plate data, and we're lucky we have six force plates in our facility. We're spoiled rotten. What it's done is it's made me go crazy, though. Because I used to think all the force happened where? Back here. All that triple extension. So she comes forward, it all happens right there. That's the magic, right? Watch out, V. They want to get you on tape. You guys at home, do you see that? Turn around sideways so they can show them. So she's in that crouch position, and she's come out of a sprint. And she's trying to propel herself off her right leg. If we had force plates under her and she accelerated, guess where most of the force is created? Is it created in the back end of the stride? No. It's created from here to about mid-stance. And then you know what fast people do? They recycle the other hip and do it again. They don't create most of their impulse forces past mid-stance. They don't create most of their impulse forces in triple extension. 
Does that hurt anybody's feelings in this room? Raise your hand. Come on. Doggone it. You know what I mean? It hurts my feelings too. For 20 years I've been training. It's all about this. I'm not saying it's not some of that. But the faster people create more earlier and get it out faster and more complete than the slow ones. Okay? The slow ones, when they're accelerating, they don't put as much force into the ground early. They like to wait until they get here, 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 and then they like to produce their force. Okay? What that causes is some bad things. It causes some overstriding, and it causes some compensation. It looks really pretty on the video. So if you guys pull up your phone again on your Twitter account, scroll down, there's a girl in a red T-shirt, and she's showing you beautiful triple extension. But the next slide shows you what trappings of that is. Because she's lacking any propulsion on the front end, she's having to open and stride. And so what we want to think now back to the hex bar is how are we going to use this tool to create what we just talked about there, which was early and a lot of force in that particular kinematic, tilted or hinged hip, bent knee, right, and early and fast. Let's step up here. Let's go ahead and get into the, to the uh, hex bars. You guys can face out. Go ahead and step. Don't step on the bands yet. Step through the bands. Go ahead and step through the bands, okay? Now grip it and rip it. Let's just assume that you guys already know how to do some hex bars. Now I'm just going to watch. Just go ahead and start. Nothing, there's no wrong lift here, right? Okay, we're just going to watch them. You guys do about six reps and then drop it and let your partner go. What I want you now is to look at is the kinematics of the lift. Stop looking at hex bar deadlift for a minute and run that, that video in your mind of acceleration. What position are the hips in? What position is the torso in? How much knee bend is there? How much thigh flexion is there relative to the torso? And where should the force be transmitted the earliest and the fastest? Where should we get most of our push? So pretend there's force plates underneath their feet. So now you've seen some basics. Good, me. That's good. Six times. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Hard stop right there. You want to get them better in acceleration? Have great technique with the hex bar. Guys, 1.9 times body weight is your goal. Girls, 1.65 times body weight, 1.6 times body weight. That's your goal to be enough to be good accelerators. Is more better? Sure. There's a law of returned investment of time, though. So those are going to be my goals in six weeks is to drive that number as close to 1.9 times body weight for, for a guy and 1.6, 1.65 for the girls. Everybody good with that? Okay. Hard stop. There you go. There's hack number one. We can make it better, though. We can make it better. Jump back on the bar again, young man. So set yourself up on the bar. Now hold right there. Pause. What did we think about now when we run the acceleration loop? And you can look on your phone on the video if you want to. Use your imagination and use your eyes. What are some of the things that we note about good accelerators? Is good flexion at the hip. And I'm talking about more than 90 degrees. More than 90 degrees. Though their ribs, their bottom two ribs, are almost touching the tops of their thighs. Okay? That's the position where they are driving impulse into the ground. So that's the position I want to be loaded in. When I was a certified idiot, I was all about, let's see how vertical we can get and make sure it's all this beautiful thing. Okay, right? I'm trying to get them, okay, get your, you know, this and drop this. If I'm thinking acceleration, as long as it's safe, I'm going to tweak more of this hinge. So I'm going to make sure that he feels pretty close proximity to these bottom two ribs and the top of his thigh. Okay? The other thing that I like, I like it to be squatty. I like his hex bar deadlift to be squatty if we're working on acceleration. Why? Because acceleration derives more from the quads than top end speed. Let me say that again. Acceleration requires more from the quadriceps than max velocity sprinting does. Okay? So you've been, we've all been taught it's all about the glutes. It's all about the glutes, right? The glutes are important. In acceleration, though, Quads and calves may dominate the mix. They may dominate the mix. Okay, so we're setting him up where he's a little more squatty. So if you guys could all set yourself up where you've got a little bit more hip hinge, where the top two ribs are touching your thighs, and make sure that your knee bit, you feel like you're getting a little bit more knee bend. Feel a little squattier with it. 
Okay, so you're going to feel flexion here and here, and then a little more flexion there and there. Very nice right here. Okay, and we're going to talk about you in just a minute behind your back. Can I flip the bar? You want to flip the bar? Well, just like... like just do the high handles, young lady. Okay. That's fine. You're nice and tall. We're going to talk about your positioning as well. Okay, so hip flexion. Okay, go ahead and get in that position and hold. Don't even lift. Hard stop. What do we see on all three of these athletes? Got to look from the side. Different body types, different heights. I notice the same thing on all three of these athletes if i am got my eyes glued. I see shin angles that are positive now. Okay, I like that. That's a positive. Okay. Hopefully that they also feel as they hold that position, they should have most of their weight in their metatarsal heads, not in their heels. How many strength coaches say, get back on your heels? For what? To slow down? Who does that? I can't afford to teach you to be slower. You already came in slow. Load the metatarsals. That's right across here. Stay down there, young man. <laughs> Grab a hold of that bar. Okay. So I see some positives. I see shin angles. I see good hip flexion. I see a lot of knee flexion. What do I not like about what I see? I see this little butt wink. You see how their, their sacrums are all kind of tilting south on me? Right here, you see this gentleman right here? Tilting south on me? Okay, go ahead and stand up. I want to set my hex bar. I only have six weeks. If I screw somebody up in my business, I'm out of business. Okay? I can't get someone hurt. I also know that fast people, when they apply force into the ground, they don't butt wink. They keep their pelvis level. They don't posteriorly tilt it way up, and they don't anteriorly tilt. They keep it nice and level. They keep it like a bucket of water. They keep that water in the bucket. So if you go, you guys address the bar again for me. Do you guys see the wink that I'm talking about? Can you see it? It's slight, right? Guys, it's not worth it to me to have them in this posture. Is it, could it injure them? You know what? Take that argument outside. I really don't, I don't want to have to argue with you if it's good or bad or healthy. Is it fast? No. Fast people don't do it. Why am I going to let her do it in a loaded position? That's just dumb, right? That's just dumb. So, well, you're asking, well, how do I correct that? I might need to find out how deep she can squat first, okay? I might need to do that. So stand back up. I'm going to show you a quick test of that. Go ahead and get on your hands and knees right here for me. A quick test of this is pretty cool. So get on your hands and knees. This is a test called the Comerford Rockback Test. And go ahead and bring your thighs out to hip or shoulder width. Right about there. Okay. Okay, now give me a big arch in your back right here. There you go. Now hold that arch for me. Can you kind of get some stiffness in through here? Mm -hmm. And now just sit your hips back slowly, as far back as you can. See how far you can stop. Go back up. Did you guys see what happened there? It's almost automatically. I'm gonna, can I flip you around, V? Mm -hmm. Flip around this way so that the camera can see oh, you. Yeah. Sorry, guys at home. I keep forgetting you're here. It's great to see you, by the way. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter if you want the notes, right? Okay. <laughs> You get, these guys aren't even looking at their phones. I don't know what's going on. Uh, so notice the big arch, right? And now watch her just sit back. And I want you to watch where her sacrum goes. Go ahead and sit back. You see it tilt? Come back up. And really kind of pretend somebody's going to try to punch you in here. Okay? Now keep that tight. Now go back. See it's still kind of tilting, right? Okay? Why is that happening? I don't, I don't really know. I could get into my physical therapy background and scour the hip and do all this other stuff. Um, a quick one that I might scan is, does she have some tightness, some muscle tightness? And here's a really quick scan of that. Take this foot and cross it over here. Now keep that arch. Now sit back. Good. Is that farther or better? Maybe a little bit. Now take this leg right here and then pull this one over here. There you go. Now do the same thing. Arch your back and sit back. Ooh. Okay. Back over here. So this was better when we folded this leg over, right? Okay. So this might be some tightness here. This might be TFL. This might be... It we, is TFL. It is. <laughs> it is. It is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you. I just met you, didn't I? <laughs> okay. So she maybe has some TFL. What can we... Ah, foam rollers and all the magic stuff that we all love, right? So that's a quick and dirty scan. We may be able to improve that. We also need to improve our understanding of when that, that tilt is happening here, right? But at the end of the day, we're going to try to find out where she could squat to. So go ahead and give me a big arch. And now rock back. Boom, right there. That's going, to be her, that's going to be her pivot point right there. You can get your goniometer out and measure that. Is this going to be a challenge for her? 
until we can clear it up, probably because we're not quite in that hip flexion that I really like for acceleration. Okay, go ahead and stand up. And so at that point, yeah, we may need to adjust by using some different toys, right? Maybe stacking a few plates and give her a chance to get as much in deflection as she can. Okay, as much as she can, because that's not worth it for me to train her into that butt wink. All right, so that's the basic hex bar. What's our numbers? What are we shooting for? 1.9 times body weight and 1.6 times body weight. Okay. Now, once you've gotten that or you're working towards that, the next step is to take that force and see how fast you can apply it. Okay. And so we talk about force a lot and force and force and force. Fast people deal with force divided by time. And that's up on the board there. It's called impulse. Okay. Fast people have a lot of force, yes. They have dominant impulse. Okay? A great analogy, and it may have been Daryl Eto that told me this analogy. I don't know. Daryl, if you told me this, I'm, I stole this from you. It may have been Lauren Seagrave that told me this. It's not about how much force you have. It's about how much you can get it out in the first 100 to 200 milliseconds. And a great analogy that he used, and it was either, either Daryl or Lauren Seagrave that did this, was he took two 44-ounce, uh, uh, what do they call them at 7-Eleven? Big gulps, right? Took two big gulps. And he called the big gulps the athletes, styrofoam big gulps. Okay, and he took those athletes in, and this is their freshman year, and so that's their potential for force. And the force is all the Coca-Cola that you can put in that big gulp. So you got two 44-ounce big gulps. You with me in 7-Eleven, in right? You go in, and you're the, the strength coach that fills them up with Coke. And you fill them up, right? And you fill them both up with 44 ounces. Great job, strength coach. When they go out and play football or run track or have to do a swerve run in soccer, they're going to be asked to get that stuff out, that Coke out of that cup, as fast as possible. They're never going to have enough time to get it all out unless they're in an arm wrestling competition or something, right? So now the strength coach, the performance coach, what we do is we modulate how big the opening is on the to-go top that we put on top of that 44-ounce big goal. Okay, so everybody take your, take your to-go lid and put it on top of your 44-ounce to-go cup. Everybody with me on that? You can picture that. Athlete A, we're going to carve a little dime-sized hole in the top of that cup. Athlete B, we're going to carve out a silver dollar size hole. And now when it's time to make that run in soccer, that's all the time we had right there to get the Coke out. Which athlete do you want? You want the one with the bigger what? The bigger hole. The bigger ability to derive what we call impulse. Okay? They're never going to dump all 44 ounces out in that moment of truth. The one that can get it out the most, the fastest, the more impulse, the better. Okay? So what we want to do now is begin to tweak up the way to train impulse in the weight room, not just force. So back in here, coach, or, uh, athletes, let's go ahead and get on the hex bars again. First group is up. This time, let's stand on the mini bands. So you're going to stand on the jump stretch bands. So compress those guys down. And again, all I've done is I've wrapped a couple of those jump stretch bands around the hex bar. But now what we're going to do, go ahead, you guys are going to do six reps this time, six reps this time. And what I'd like for you to do is stand up as fast as you can. Now gradually crescendo this up because you guys aren't warm. But each rep, get faster and faster and faster. Go ahead. Stand up fast and then go ahead and step down. Up fast and then down slow. Good. Up fast, down slow. Get six. Again, you're trying to get that flexion at the hip, make it very squatty. And I like how you have the bands under the met heads, right? We don't have the bands under the heels. We want pressure on the metatarsal heads. Good. Next guy's up. And this is, again, where I think we may miss the boat with some of all the Olympic lifts and pulls from the floor. I love those. Guys at home, Doc Half and everybody, I love them. I love them. But I got six weeks. I got to get people ready to go. What I'm going to look for, instead of a drag and drive, I want them to get the weight going as fast as possible. Okay? So what I want you guys to think about is the minute your hands feel pressure is you are getting out of the hole as fast as you can. You're trying to put as much into the hole early as possible. Okay? Six reps. Very nice. You guys got the idea? Simple enough? Okay? Mini bands, very simple. What does that do? That allows you to start adding some impulse to the bar. Okay, the first, first per person back up again. Okay. Now we can tweak it even farther. We can tweak the hex bar even farther. So we've added explosive work, explosive work. 
We can also tweak it into a positional thing. So let's get into a staggered stance. So you can, you can straddle the band with your left foot back, your right foot in front. You don't even need to be on the band at this okay. point. There you go. Now bring this foot across the top. There you go, just like that. So let's have your right foot in front, and I want you to pivot where you feel those first two ribs on your thigh, and I want about 80% of your weight on the metatarsal heads of your right foot. You guys feel that position? So you should be shifted forward, 80-20. Okay, and at this point, let's go ahead and lift from the floor six times, 80-20, right, right leg forward. Go ahead. Okay, back down, good. Okay, and make sure you keep the weight forward. Good. Weight in the metatarsal heads. Good. That's excellent. You see what you feel what you're doing there? You're almost feeling like you're coming forward, right? Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. We're beginning to orientate the forces, right? Beginning to orientate the forces. And so that becomes sort of a base progression for me is to make sure that we're strong enough. 1.9 times body weight for men, 1.6 times girls. Depends on age, right? Depends on training age and other things. Generally speaking, that's going to be our numbers there that we're shooting for. And then making sure we drive impulse. So we're going to make sure we're getting more at the bottom of this lift than just at the mid-range, which is what I was taught, right? Drag, and then what? And then explode. It's too late. You must be here. And it's got to happen almost here. Now, I'm not advocating jerking your shoulders out of sockets. I'm not advocating that. But if you train this enough and you double your wrists underneath and really fold things tight, you can almost yank this thing off the floor, okay? I've got in my power, in my, uh, in my Twitter account, the percentages that we use, percentages off of those maxes, to optimize that. And, and interestingly enough, on this lift, 40% of the RM becomes a pretty nice sweet spot. 40% of the RM, and again, those numbers are on the, uh, on the Twitter feed. Get into the staggered stance position, etc. So the hex bar is a great tool. We'll even use it for our explosive work. So if you guys will step off now onto the uh, floor. V, you guys and T, where'd Tally go? She's hiding on me. Okay, come here. Let's have you two guys grab those bars, okay? It's even a nice tool for explosive strength. So remember your, your force velocity curve? We're, see how we're kind of sliding down that curve now? Now we're into that explosive strength piece. Okay, so now we're even lighter loads. Go ahead and grab the bar and stand up. Go ahead and stand up. Now, what I want you to do now is to get into that hip hinge position. You don't even have to set it on the ground, but you want to be nice and, nice and squatty with your knees like we were before. Make sure your ribs are down there close to your thighs. Perfect. Feel like you've loaded your quads. You should have the weight on the balls of your feet, right? And now what I want you to do is a counter movement. I want you to dip about two inches quickly and then jump vertically. You're going to do six of them. Make sure that the dip is very quick and that you feel. Yeah, go ahead and dip. Good. The dip has got to be quick, so it's a counter movement. Loaded jump, using the hex bar. So quick dip, pump, pump, good. Balls of the feet, balls of the feet, right? Balls of the feet, good, watch again. Dip fast, good. Now you feel where your body's starting to go, right? You're orientating your force, that's okay. Dumb strength coach back in the early 90s, jump straight up, jump straight. Well, I'm trying to work on amplitude and orientation here, right? So I wouldn't even mind if you were coming out forward in some cases on that. But that's where the load should feel, all right? Go ahead and drop the bars. Okay, now next guys are up. You guys try the same thing. Now try it in that splits, that uh, staggered stance position. Right leg in front. 80% of your weight on the right leg. Load up the right metatarsal heads, not the heel. The right metatarsal heads. So it's 80%. Now pivot, get those ribs close to the thigh. And now again, dip fast and explode in the air. Just like that. Make sure you dip. What is the dip giving us? Giving us that little stretch. It's replicating what happens when they stab the ground. They're going from light to all of a sudden the earth is on them, right? And so we're replicating that. Very nice. Good. Okay. Simple, simple progression, right? Strength, strength, speed, explosive strength. We'll get outside and do some speed strength in just a minute as well, and even some, just some flat-out speed. You guys kind of picture all that. And again, all the numbers for the hex bar are in my, uh, in my phone. If you've got access to some toys, some of my favorite toys, I live in a utopia. Michael gives me any equipment that I need because he doesn't want me to have any excuses. Okay? I can't go to him. Ah, I couldn't get him faster because I didn't have enough equipment. Okay? That's what he does to me. I use gym aware. 
Okay, I use the bar sensei. I use tendos. I've got some bar speeds. If you guys have access to those tools, I've got some bar speeds that we look for for that entire curve on this particular lift. I'm a big believer in that because sometimes V is going to come in and she's going to be at 100% of herself and she's ready to go, mm -hmm. right? I'm always. Always ready to go. Yeah. Guess what? No, you're not, oh, okay? Man. Even though she tells me, okay, and she's a good, she's a good athlete, right? Coach, you're, you guys made them tough. Where's some of these college coaches in here? We made them tough, haven't we, coaches? Yeah. How you doing today? I'm good. They're lying to you, okay? They're lying to you. They don't know how good they are. They are as good as they are. She could be at 80% of her best today, okay? Now, if you've got a mega wave and you've got it, that's great too. You can use the velocity of the bar to be able to tell what percentage of, her, of herself she is today. And then you can try your psychological techniques to try to amp her up a little bit. You can get the music on. You like, what kind of music would you listen to to amp yourself up? Um, Give me an artist. Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. We put some Lil Wayne on, right? We get some smelling salts. We're going to try to dial that up <laughs> as much as we can. But if the video game reps tell me otherwise, we've amped her up, I've motivated her, I've done everything that I can, and she's still not hitting the speed numbers on these lifts for whatever part of that curve I'm training, I'm going to make a pivot. I'm going to make a pivot because speed for me is going to trump how much is on the load. The time thing, that time factor is, remember, I'm training the lid, right? I'm training that lid, and if I'm trying to make a bigger lid, and I train this athlete, at, she's 80% of herself, and I'm going to see how much she can do, how fast, and I'm just going to beat her down until she does it, and then we're going to chest bump and say, great job. There's a chance that I've actually made that hole smaller, and I only have six weeks. I can't do that, or I go out of business, okay? So that's why I make that decision. There is a time and a place for me to go, V, let's go. You got to go, Right? <laughs> right? but there's also a time and a place to adjust to meet her where she is and some of those toys some of those those things that are out there are available to you guys to meet them there okay so that's a great example of that progression there's some other progressions in the weight room that I'll, I'll show you that are not on my uh on my list and we're gonna go outside one of them that I love is the step up and I and I thought about that when I saw these boxes I'm afraid we're doing step ups all wrong and I'm I'm the worst at, at come over here and do a step up for me girls here, V, stand up there. I'm going to use V as my, uh, as my demo. If you guys want to pull that box up, up against there. Actually, pull that, I, I tell you what, pull that box. Uh, can you, here, let's do this one. V, you be here. We'll be here. Okay. Okay, so let's have you guys on this box here. Okay. V, we'll have you here. So turn around, come up here on the platform for me. I love step-ups. I love them. Let's tweak them for acceleration. I thought about this when I saw the boxes. I said, maybe we'll have time to do this. Is let's tweak step-ups a little bit better. We were all taught, NSCA taught us, right, to do a step-up. Show us the NSCA certified step-up. Okay, nice and tall. What did they teach us? Nice tall posture, right? Nice vertical shin. Yep. Beautiful. Do it again. All right, you have just passed. Congratulations. Sweet. Way to go. Okay, let's see you, V. Let's make sure you can do a step-up first. Okay. And again, box height, I'll tell you how I differentiate that. Tweak it now. Now use your mind. Let's tweak it for acceleration for a minute. What are some tweaks? Huh? Torso. So now get, address the box, but this time let's get that rib cage down on the thigh. Ah, okay. I like that. Let's make it a little bit more squatty. How could we do that? Load the knee up a little bit, right? Now without bending, this is the big problem I have with the kids that I train. I don't know if they do it in your gym or not. But this step up becomes a left leg step up when you start cueing them, right? And so watch, now do what you just did right there. Now go ahead and do a step up, yeah. Why is this left leg shaking? <laughs> I thought we were training the right leg, cause I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but I thought step ups were for this leg, right? Yep. Okay, so how are we gonna cue that? What are some cues we can do to cue that? Well, one that our coaches use a lot is we like to cue dorsiflexion on the backside. So now instead of being on your tiptoe, why don't you go to your heel and dorsiflex, get your met heads off the ground. Okay, now you can't touch the metatarsal heads on the back foot. Okay, now stand up. Just like that, try it again. Okay, good, back down. Now pull your toes up in the air on the back side. Good, yeah, and load there. Okay, now drive without push. Yeah, you feel the difference there? Yeah. Do you guys see the subtle little difference? And I encourage you at the break to try that. It's a little, dorsi we call it dorsiflexion on the backside leg, where you're literally on your heel only 
as you load up the lead leg. Okay, so try that again, V. It's hard, right? Because we've done them so much. And then we start adding load. And I love loaded step-ups. I'm here to tell you on, on acceleration, what, what's, the, what's the hamstring they're going to pull when they're accelerating, you college coaches? Which part of the hamstring when they're accelerating and they pull a hammy? What's it going to be? It's going to be their biceps fam, isn't it? Every stinking time. Watch them from the front sometimes. A lot of why they're doing that is not because of any kind of weird rotation or any other overstride. It's because of side bending. And so one of the cool cues that we'll use for step-ups to make it a little bit better for acceleration is we'll provide unilateral resistance and we'll put it on the side of the leg that they're stepping up with. Because in essence, what we want to do is cue her not to side bend towards the leg. So we're putting it in this arm. And what I've seen a lot of times when that biceps fem gets nicked up, at least in the closed chain part of it, or the late swing phase part of it, is when there's some side bending. Watch Usain Bolt, he had a lot of this. A lot of this that he started to clean up later on in his career. Okay, so what we're gonna do is use some resistance as she does that step up. So I'll go ahead and do that step up again, and then back down. And again, and you can see now she's approximating the thigh with the rib cage. What about her shin angle? What can we do there? Make it a little bit more forward, right? Make it a little bit more forward. Go ahead, coach. Let's have you jump up there and do the same thing. Here's a trick that I use for that. Is I'm going to use bands to orientate him to where he's going to have to be a little more, more aggressive. And so go ahead and do, a, do three reps for me that same way. Go ahead. One. Dorsey flex that back foot for me. Nah, Dorsey flex. You can't use your back foot. Keep that met head off the ground. There you go. Do you feel what happened there? Yeah. Guys, oh. do that. Do five sets of ten of those. That way, you will blow your mind how crappy you've been doing step-ups your whole life. Trust me. Okay, that's me talking. We've all been doing them wrong for so long. But now one of the things that we use at MJP is to cue up a little bit different orientation is just use a band. So go ahead and step into this for me, Em. Put it around your waist. waist. Yep. Both legs. Well, you, if you want to try it the other way, I'm anxious to see how that's going to work out for you. <laughs> okay. So now all we're doing... We're not trying to overload him with bands, right? The strength stimulus is coming from the vertical. All we're trying to do with the bands is to cue him into more angles, right? We're trying to cue him to get a little bit more knee, a little bit more shin angle here that you see on the, on the uh, Twitter feed, right? Okay, and as he comes through now, it's going to force feed him to create an orientation of that downforce with a, whoa, see there? Yeah. And it's going to be a quick learning curve. Do six of them and see how quickly you learn on this. Okay. He's going to learn or he's going to fall over, right? There you go. What did he do? He took his center of mass, which is right here at a ziphoid process. You know what he did? He pulled it forward. We call that guts in front. Guess who does that really, really well? Fast freaks. Okay? They do a great job of getting their guts in front of where the impulse is loaded into the ground. And this is another one of those simple cues that you guys can each use to attack that. And I'm not saying overload. Okay, strength coaches, here we go. I know, that's me. Well, if orange is good, let me go get the, where are those blue bands at? <laughs> right? I'm going to get the blue bands out. No, it's not for overload. It's for orientation. Does that make sense? Are we fair with that? Okay, good. Any questions on the hex bar deadlift stuff or the step ups? Simple, simple. Go ahead. I like uh, any answer to that. Don't have a trap bar. What do you use? If you don't have a trap bar, folks at home, Dumbbells work great. Kettlebells can work pretty well as, as well. Uh, sandbags, some of our coaches have the, uh, the sandbags that we're using with some of our offsites, if you have access to those. Other questions about the weight room? Yes, sir. Yes, so I'm going to put the accommodating resistance on when I'm doing the strength speed side of the continuum. The max stuff, I'm keeping the bands off. So the 1.9 is without bands. 1.6 without bands. And then I'll go a lighter band with heavier resistance. And then when the, the weight starts coming down, that's when the bands start getting, getting up. And that's where I'm going to start getting my toys out here and finding out what's the optimum. 40% of their RM is, is a sweet spot. And then you use the accommodating resistance to match what it looks like. Is it, is it getting all wonky? Are they slowing it down? Or is it, really, is it really helping them accommodate the resistance? So it's more of a feel thing then. Okay, so the BBT is with uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cos? Can, can I get the same effect if 
load my prowlers correctly with a high handle You're way ahead of me. We're going to go outside and we're going to hit that, Coach. Absolutely. We're going to, we're going to orient this force, and we're going, to, we're going to train impulse out there, though. We're going to train impulse. You're on, you're on top of it. I learned all this from you, Cos. What are you talking about? Yeah. So the question is, the 1.9 or the 1.6, is that just for linear or just for lateral? This is applying to acceleration linearly, which applies to every athlete you train. There is no such thing as a rotational athlete. They are an athlete that rotates. Oh, you liked that, didn't you? Write that down. <laughs> Golly. Rotational athlete. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. They are athletes that rotate, right? And so I like the fact that they can accelerate linearly very, very well, even if they do spend most of their time rotationally. That makes sense? Great question, though. Okay, quickly, outside, let's go. Now, you guys gather, gather in tight. Gather in tight so I don't have to yell lose my voice. I got it. Okay. So now the weight room by itself is phenomenal about acceleration, right? You look at the curve that I put on my, my Twitter feed again that talks about how important explosive and concentric strength is to the acceleration early parts of anything, even the 100 meter dash. The first part is very important. So make no mistake, that's a key, that's a key environment. Taking that force now and now sliding down the curve, okay, sliding down that force velocity curve a little bit, let's get into some of the speed strength parts of these elements, okay? And this is where we like to tweak our metrics. Pack number two, if you were following along on Twitter, get out, okay? If you are worried about your vertical jump going up, that's fine, it's admirable. That's not where your best worry should be if you're trying to improve your acceleration, though. Okay? Vertical jumping is great. Horizontal jumping is better for acceleration from our perspective. Okay, so here's some tweaks to your plyometrics to help you leverage that for acceleration. One of them that we like is somewhat of a new one. Come ahead and draw out here. Let's have you guys stand on the white line, please. White line there, M. You guys walk out this way. Put a little bit of resistance and now turn around and face me. There you, go. you guys are going to be my jumpers, you're going to be my jumpers first. Okay. Okay. One of the first that we like is we call an up and out. An up and out. We know a lot of kids and a lot of your athletes know how to jump. of the force that we're working on here. Get it in there and then orientate your thrusters out here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a vertical jump and when you land on the ground in the same place that you are now, at that point I want you to feel yourself loading into your metatarsal heads with that rib cage down, getting nice and squatty, getting kind of knee dominant. Oh heck, oh my god, he said it. There goes their ACLs, right? No. Squatty. Let's make it squatty. Let's get on the metatarsal heads, and I want you to follow that up with a broad jump. Okay? You guys got to accommodate the resistance a little bit. Okay? So you're going to have to kind of follow them along and give them a little just enough. You got to be a good coach. There's some other equipment that's pretty good for this. The, the Raptor piece by Rotomax is pretty good. But you can use If you're a good coach back there, you're going to do the same thing. Okay, you guys ready? Three of them. You're going to go up, down, out. Up, down, out. On my command, we're going to do three. You guys ready? Up. Hit and now out. Good. Good. Again, ready? Just keep working this way. You guys are going to accommodate, right? Ready? Up and out. Good. One more time. Good. When you come up and you land, what are you thinking? What are we trying to cue them with the pull? We want them to be on the balls of their feet, orientating the shin bones this way and the torso this way. So as you guys land, you should be coiling the spring in this fashion. Not straight up and down. You feel what happened to you when you did that? You fall backwards, right? Good cue. Ready? Up and out. Good. Talia, excellent. Did you feel the transfer there? Nice job. Switch it around. You're there on the white line, and you guys are this way. You guys be good coaches back there, right? Be good coaches. But this is doing as it's teaching you how to reorientate. And if you don't, you're going to end up falling backwards, right? What else did you notice? What does it force them to do? Get their what in front? 
Guts in front. There went my microphone, NSCA. Can you still hear me? I'm testing. Houston, Houston, Houston. We're going to go. All right, you guys ready? Ready. Up and out. Good. Ready. Up and out. Good. Ready. Up and out. Good. Okay. You feel all that? Yeah. Where was all that goody spilling? All that ground force. You guys see where it spilled out of this guy? I mean, all of it was just spilling out of here, right? That's okay. Fast freaks are very stiff and rigid, yet very loose. It's a weird thing. They're able to be loose, yet very rigid at the point of impact. Okay, and so that's going to be something we're going to coach up on this athlete is a little bit more stiffness as he transfers through here. And some of that's coming actually from his ankle, and we'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so up and outs is one. You guys fold back here. Here's a new one, though. You may have seen up and outs. Here's a new one. Not so new if, you, if you're an NSCA person. Somebody, and I want somebody to tell me who named it this because I want to know what it stands for. It's called the cup. Nobody named it here? Okay. I have no idea what KUP stands for, but this is a great plyometric drill for acceleration that begins to orientate the forces, but also begins to draw in that scissor effect that fast people use when they accelerate. Fast people don't turn things over when they accelerate, they scissor at their femurs. Okay? And so we want to train some of that scissoring effect as we produce the ground reaction forces we want. So get into a split stance for me. Just partial resistance back there. Okay? And you're going to get into a split squat position. Okay? And the first one I just want you to do is I want you to do a split squat jump. So you're just going to jump like we did in there, jump up and come back on the right leg. Go ahead, up. You are way ahead of me. Just start with your right leg. Okay. Yeah, right leg in front. There you go. Again, ready? Up. One more time. Ready? Up. Nice job, turn around you guys now. Right leg in front, split, squat, jump, three times. Ready? Up, up, and up. Okay, getting the feel of it, right? We're learning, this is an advanced thing. As you progress this, the next one's gonna be a cycled split, squat, jump. Love the, the plyometric progressions you saw on the slides, right? Are we doing all this in one day to look as sexy as we can? No, that's dumb, right? That's dumb, that'll get them hurt and make them slower. Over a three, six, eight week progression, we're gonna progress through this. Probably once every two weeks, we're gonna tweak this split jump. And the next step wise is gonna be a cycled split jump. So now cycle to the left side. So your right leg's in front, cycle to the left side. Ready, jump, jump, and jump. Good, you three, ready. Cycled split squat jump, ready, jump, jump, jump. Nice job. Progression three is the cup. Progression three is the cup. And this is the hard one, it's the tricky one. Right leg in front. Now you're gonna jump, and as you jump, you're going to hip flex on the left, then you're gonna tuck on the right, and you're gonna come back down in that position just like that. On the same leg? On the same leg, it's gonna look like this. So you're here, you're pushing, pup, pup, up. Pup, pup, okay, you're actually driving hip flexion to help the hip extension. Cycled split squat jump tuck or cup. You land, on the same leg. you land on the same leg. To do this right, you're gonna have to scissor. You're gonna have to scissor. If not, you're gonna feel really awkward. So no offense, only if 1,000 people are watching you on tape right now, okay, you ready? <laughs> Cycled split squat jump with a tuck. Ready, jump, jump, jump. Okay, what are they missing? The second tuck, you guys try. Yeah. If you are thinking, I'm just got to tuck the one that I'm dragging through, that seems pretty easy. The, the key thing is how we're going to scissor and switch to that next tuck. All right, so right leg in front. Ready? Jump. Switch it back. Ready? Jump. Better. Jump. It's hard, right? Yeah. It's hard, right? And that's supposed to be hard. You're not, you, you're not like a 10-200 person, are you? No. Not yet? But no. Maybe like 10 years Maybe ago. 10 years. No, not even 10 the years. The thing is, though, when we see things like that, that's some of that biomotor stuff. We know we can make her faster. That's a biomotor thing. We can make that scissor faster. And that's a drill that's going to really help you, especially as long as you are, right? Let's try this again one more time. Watch again, guys. Here, split. 
jump, you're going to tuck, you're going to tuck on the right, and you're going to come back down and load that impulse. You guys see where all this is starting to come from? Impulse loading, scissoring, right here. Okay, ready? Jump. Give me more of a tuck on the right leg too. Jump. Go, ha ha, ha ha, ready, jump. That's better, you feel it? Yep. Okay, good, last time for you guys to try. Right leg in front, ready. Jump. <laughs> Golly, I wish I had six weeks to work with you, ready. Good, one more, ready, jump. That's good, V. And all we, what we'd work on with this athlete at this point is what? Cycled split jump, that's where we're gonna start her. Right, we're gonna start her on cycled split jump and then get her, because that's a long lever right there. Speaking of plyometrics, she's about four inches taller than the average reference woman, right? What are we gonna do with her volume of plyos? Lower, what are we gonna do with the height of the things that she's jumping over? Lower, okay? You already know all this stuff, right? You already know all this stuff. You just have to apply it. That would be a great application for her, right? Okay, great. So we drop that out. The last plyo, the last plyo, and then I'll tell you about the speed decrement since we're running short on time. Go ahead and pull these back, guys. The last plyo, hack number two, is bounding. Bounding. Most of your athletes suck at bounding, right? Okay. Fast people can bound like a dude odd day. I've seen it. They just do it. I don't know. I like these prowlers or whatever these are, whatever brand these are. So let's line up behind one here. And I want you guys to do a prowler push for me all the way down to those cones. Ready, go. Rah! Come on. Prowler push. Okay. That's a prowler push. I don't do prowler pushes, ever. <laughs> Just want to be clear. Okay. What I do is I use the prowler to teach bounding. So now what these athletes are going to do, you can flip them around. Now they're going to use the prowler. Oh, I don't have a prowler. Stop making excuses. Do you know where a shopping cart is that you can borrow? Go get one of those and put some, get some, put some weight in there, okay? Stop making excuses you don't have enough equipment. Be creative and innovative. Shopping cart actually works better than the prowler. People? Where are you from? What are you, where are you people? You have to show me that one later on. Okay, so now this time, this time, we're going to bound. We're going to bound, and, and this becomes that scissoring effect. And so it's a scissoring we are going to advance the thigh. You noticed all three of those when they were prowler pushing, what were they advancing? Their heels up and cycling. What I want to do is minimize that, and I want to optimize the thigh scissor action. You guys see the scissor action? Fast people, the recovery of this toe is about three inches off the ground when they do this. And it begins to look like bounding. You with me? V already did your work. You can walk down there. You two ready to bound? Ready, set, and go. And what at times I'll do, that's it, keep bounding. Good. I'll come along behind and I'll slap them if they pick that foot up. That a girl. Uh, uh. Difference, yes? Slight. Why is he so enamored with the details? Because I've got six weeks. <laughs> I can't waste time. That's a great workout. Just doing 20 yards of prowler pushes 10 times, 45 seconds rest. What am I working on? Am I doing that? Metabolics, not acceleration. You will train somebody to do the exact opposite thing that fast people do, okay? Don't think for a minute that you can do no harm, okay? I think making somebody slower is harmful, okay? That's doing harm. We're not supposed to do any harm. Stop making people slower. Okay. Those of you that train young athletes, if they're under 11 years old, don't even work on acceleration. You can make them slower. You can slow their nervous system down. You think you're doing a great job doing nine-year-old prowler pushes until kids are puking. Congratulations. You've probably made them slower. And if they're slower, they don't enjoy sport as much. 
If they don't enjoy sport as much, they don't play it as long. If they don't play sport as long, they're fat and sloppy and out of shape. They don't like their cells. They're hurting, <laughs> okay, as adults. That's science. That's not me talking, okay? Let's keep them enjoying sport. Helping them to be faster is one way to help them enjoy their sport more, okay? Last thing, and I'm done. And we're not going to get to pull the sleds. Thank you guys for helping me. One of the things that I talked about, hack number three, is the speed decrement theory. And I know a lot of you guys are using sleds. So if we're taking the sled and we're dragging sleds now as our speed application, how much weight on the sled? Some new science on that. Turn you into here. Pretty cool stuff. We've been using this with our combine classes and having huge results. Used to be the 10% rule. Remember that rule? You wanted to slow them down 10% of their fastest time in that distance that you were resisting. Anybody remember that rule? Did anybody here make that rule up? Good. Where did that come from? I have no idea. I still don't know where that came from. But we've been using it for a long time. Some researchers have now looked at that. And they begin to find out that potentially heavier sled dragging can be more beneficial for acceleration. To the tune, to the tune of something that slows you down by over 50% by over 50% of your fastest rep, okay? And in some cases, that's 80% of a person's body weight. So we're talking about heavy sled pulling. How do we know? We stand back here with a little pocket radar. It costs about 165 bucks. And we measure each athlete. So V would be running at her, whatever, her maximum intensity for 10, 20, or 25 meters. We'd be measuring that speed. And our coaches stand there with the radar gun and they're measuring their best speed for that day. And then we're coming back into the sled and we're loading the sled and measuring the speed. And we are adjusting the resistance on the sled for V to keep it at a certain percentage of her speed decrement or a decrement of her speed. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's variable. V could be at 100% of her best today, she could be at 80%. But we're gonna load the sled and create the optimum environment for her to create force, orientate the force, right? And then ultimately see how much of that force we can get out as fast as possible using basic, basic tools that hopefully you all have access to. Guys, that's all my time. If you're, if you're interested in more, I hate to be that guy. I got a pretty good Instagram feed or a Twitter feed of all this information we went over. You can contact me via that, this place. I'll be doing some other things around the, uh, around the world this year on acceleration. I look forward to seeing you, but thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for your help.